Great, thanks, Craig. Um, well, welcome everyone. Um, it's great to see so many people here this morning interested in stoneflies. Uh, I'm Craig McAdam. I'm conservation director with Bug Life, but in my um, my spare time, I'm um, national recorder for the Stonefly Recording Scheme. Today, I'm going to give you an introduction to stoneflies. I'm going to give a, a, a summary of the species found in Britain, some details of the extinct and endemic species. I'll take a bit of a look at their life cycle and ecology before talking about collecting and recording. I'll then stop for some questions um, before giving an overview of their identification. But first of all, I'd like to just give you a little introduction to bug life. So who's Bug Life? Well, Bug Life is the only organisation in Europe dedicated to the conservation of all invertebrates, um, from mayflies to millipedes, stoneflies to starfish. Our aim is to halt extinctions of invertebrate species and achieve populations of invertebrates in the uh, sustainable populations of invertebrates in the UK and further afield. We do this through a range of activities, including inspiring others to get out there and see bugs um, and see their habitats at first hand by shaping policy and uh, and um, decision makers thoughts about invertebrates and, and what they need to do. We undertake um, a practical conservation work such as this bog project um, near, oops, sorry, I think the timing's wrong on this. Um, the practical conservation like this bog project uh, near Cumbernauld. Um, and we also get out there and we, we raise awareness about invertebrates, their habitats and their conservation um, one of the policies that we have is a freshwater strategy, and that has eight um, broad principles that we think that society should aspire to to uh, conserve freshwater invertebrates. And what I'm going to do today is really touch on two of those, which is about understanding, cherishing and properly valuing uh, aquatic invertebrates, and particularly stoneflies, and monitoring of freshwater invertebrates. So that's enough about bug life. Now on to stoneflies. There's more than 3,500 species of stoneflies in the world um, known, known to date, and um, we're still discovering some other ones, some new ones. Um, and in the UK, we've got 35 species. There's 35 species that have been recorded over the time. Stoneflies are a really ancient group of insects. You know, there's, there are fossils from the early Permian era, so that's about 260 million years ago. And unlike most other groups of insects, they're mainly temperate in distribution. So they, there's not many in the tropics, not many um, in in the south, southern hemisphere, um, in in uh, warmer climates. Um, but in temperate conditions, you can you can often get quite a, a range of stoneflies. They're mainly found in cool, fast-flowing, well-oxygenated upland streams, um, which is why they do so well in the UK. We've got um, two endemic species in the UK. So these are species that are found nowhere else in the world. Um, and we've also got two endemic subspecies, again, found nowhere else in the world. Although the, the parent species, if you like, is, is found elsewhere. And I'll talk about them uh, in a moment. So we've got 35 species in the UK. This is the, the species list here. And you can see that we've got um, seven different families of, of stonefly. Um, in the in identification session, I'll go through each of those families and, and explain how you can identify them. Um, but you can see here that they're roughly split up, um, you know, fairly evenly split up apart from the Muridae, which um, is the, the biggest family that we've got in the UK um, with 12 species. Um, we, if the, the more eagle eyed of you will have noticed that two of the species, Xanthoperla apicalis over, over um, here and Isoperla obscura here, I've got a little asterisk next to them. And these are both species that are now thought to be extinct in the UK. Xanthopella apicalis is only known from three specimens in the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. Um, the, the specimens only say England on them. Um, there's, no other, there's no other description than that. Although the original des description of them in, in the literature does mention Worcestershire, it mentions um, Herefordshire, you know, it mentions far more locations than the, the specimens that are uh, in the in the collection. This in, in Europe, this is typically found in larger lowland rivers. So, um, you know, it might be still living in the in the, the bigger rivers like the Severn or the, or the Trent. Um, but 
uh, it's probably a long shot. It's quite a distinctive insect. It's, it's quite small, um, this uh, brilliant yellow colour, but the, the two-tone antennae are pretty distinctive. The other extinct species is also found in big rivers, and that's Isoperla obscura. That's only ever been found in the River Trent near Nottingham. It was found uh, over over about a decade. There were there were records came in for for that species in the early 1900s, but despite recent searches, the, the species hasn't been re-recorded. Um, it is again, it is possible it's there, um, but uh, we've not found it yet. And just to demonstrate that you know these things do sometimes turn up again. Um, Isogenus nubecula was found in the Welsh River D in 1959. That was the first record of it. But um, it suffered a catastrophic decline there. You know, it went down to um, very few numbers, and then it hadn't been seen for uh, 25 years. And then um, John David Bowker from the Freshwater Biological Association had been going out there for those 25 years looking for it, and finally rediscovered it in 2017 at Bagger, and has been able to find it elsewhere on the river since. So, so just you know, that that's why we don't declare something. Uh, extinct lightly, we uh, you, you need to be fairly sure that it's actually gone before you you, you call it extinct. And as this uh, species shows, you know sometimes these things can come back from the dead. Um, we also have uh, new species arriving in the UK, or at least being found in the UK. Um, Nomura lacustris was added to the British list in 2012. It superficially looks like uh, a very common stonefly and uh, Nomura cinerea. Um, but this one is almost exclusively, I think it is exclusively found in Winterbournes in the south of England. And it has a it has a quite a restricted distribution, all, only in these Winterbournes um, across the south of England. And um, but it, it may turn up in some of the other uh, temporary streams, perhaps in the Peak District. So looking at our endemic species, so uh, the endemic subspecies first, uh, this is uh, the February red stonefly. This is Tineoptrix nebulosa britannica, which um, these are these are the adults. I, I will, I'll cover the uh, I'll cover the um, the identification of the larvae in the second part of this uh, workshop. But um, this is a very early season fly. This is this is out now um, and has probably been out for a month already. Um, and that, what's quite interesting is it's got very long legs. And one of the possible reasons for this is because it's coming out onto, onto snow and it needs to keep its body away from the snow so it doesn't actually freeze. The other endemic subspecies is Capnea vidua anglica, um, has been called the widow stonefly. Um, this again is a very uh, uh, early season species. This will be coming out in the next month. Um, it's found in upland streams. Um, there are records. There are records across the UK. Um, is, I should have said Tineoptrix nebulosa is, is really quite common. We we get it in in both upland streams and in lowland streams. Um, this one is more in upland streams and in, in fast flowing upland streams. And um, uh, there I've, I've had, had records recently of it from um, the Friesen Gallery, from the Cairngorms and from the Lake District. It's the full, full endemic species, um, we've got two of those. The first one is the orange striped stonefly, Perlodes mortoni. Now this is a really common species um, found across most of the UK apart from the, the southeast. Um, it's not found in Ireland, it was recorded in Ireland but hasn't been, um, hasn't been found there in I think it's uh, 50 or 60 years, um, so it's and it's, it's quite a distinctive species. It's got this um, orange stripe on the head and on the the pronotum. Um, as I said, this is quite common. Um, this will be out and about in March, April. It is uh, the best place to look for it is is on bankside um, structures. It, it I've, I've 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 often found on the top of bridges. Um, the adults, will, the females will sit there while they're um, getting ready to lay their eggs. And the final endemic species is the northern February red, um, Brachyptura putata. This species is um, related to Taneoptrix. Uh, it's in the same same family. 
It's only found now in the north of Scotland. It was first recorded from um, the Clyde at uh, New Lanark, and it has been recorded in the past from the Usk and the Y, but there's been no records um, for for quite some time. And so we now think it's only record it's only restricted to the north of Scotland. That's a female there and a male there. It's also got the 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 distinction, I suppose, of being um, perhaps the only stonefly to to for its type locality to feature on a banknote. This is actually the the type locality of of both um, the northern February red and the the black uh, winter stonefly, and this 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 is the River Clyde here, and the the industrial um, heritage site of New Lanark. Okay, so uh, let's just explore a bit about their life cycles. Um, we're going to start off with uh, mating. So here, here we see two mating individuals. Uh, the the male is on the top, the female is on the, the bottom. You can see the slight difference in size there, which is common in, in quite a lot of different insect groups. Um, the male will couple with the the female and stay coupled for uh, it can be quite a long time. It can be you know ten minutes or so, um, maybe longer. Um, sometimes it's quite quick. Um, th there's a lot we don't know about mating in stoneflies, and it's something that is a, a is an interesting topic to explore, you know, do they mate more than once? Um, what what triggers mating and things like that? What happens though is when once they've once they've mated, the, the female will then go off and, and mature her eggs. And you can see here in this image, um, you can see the eggs at the end of the abdomen there. And many of the species create uh, this this ball, this sort of clutch of eggs. Um, there can be less than 50 eggs in, a, in, in uh, produced by an adult stonefly in the Chloroperlidae, but over 3,000 in our largest species, Perla bipunctata. And they're often laid in, in more than one batch, so they up to eight batches, depending on the species. And these are little, little balls of eggs that are held at the, the end of the abdomen. Eggs themselves um, are quite ornate in some cases. Um, they are, uh, and, and these structures on the eggs, these sort of like ridges and, and plates and things that we see on the eggs are um, actually useful for, actually, for identification. We're not going to go into that today um, because that needs some specialist equipment. Um, but, you know, some of the species are, are actually only separated from their, their, their sister species, if you like. Um, by the, the shape and the size of the egg, uh, the plates on the eggs. Um, the eggs are quite interesting because they, there's been quite a lot of work done on them, um, mostly by uh, Malcolm Elliott at the Freshwater Biological Association, um, who looked at um, the tolerances and the egg hatching and, and incubation periods of eggs. And this graph at the side here is just a, 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 a summary of Malcolm's um, studies. And what's interesting is that there's, there's quite a narrow tolerance um, for some of these species and, and the, the optimum um, temperature for egg development is the, is the dot on these lines. And you see that they're quite, it's quite, quite a narrow um, mean um, optimum development temperature. And that, that can be quite a limiting factor and is probably what is, is, um, is preventing them occurring in warmer climates. So the nymphs um, or larvae, um, I'll, I'll mix between calling them nymphs and larvae. They, they, they used to be that they were anything um, that didn't go through a full metamorphosis was called a nymph. Um, and anything that did, uh, like uh, uh, butterflies and, and beetles and, and caddisflies, uh, were called larvae. Um, the, now it tends to just be that everything is called larvae, um, but I'll probably mix between the two as I go through this. This is a typical uh, nymph, um, stonefly, stonefly nymph. Um, most live only for a year, although we do have some that have uh, more than one generation a year. And we also have some, the, the bigger ones, which can take up to three, over three years to, to develop. There's a, anything between 10 to 35 molts uh, as, a, as a larvae. So uh, these are instars, they're called, which are the growth periods between um, when they need to shed their skin. 
um, because as with all insects, their, their outer skin is their, is their skeleton and they need to actually get rid of that so they can grow. So they molt that up to 35 times. And when they do that molt, um, it's, it's often you'll find, particularly things uh, in the perlodidae, you find that they're completely clear. They look like a little glass um, uh, uh, nymph and uh, it takes a while for their colour to actually harden, their, their skin to harden up, their cuticle to harden up and for the colour to come back. All of the larvae start the life as herbivores, um, and but the larger species become carnivorous partway through their growth. There are various other um, little quirks about their feeding um, as well. You know, some will feed con almost continuously, some will, will only feed during the night and, and so on. Um, and as they near maturity, the wing pads start to develop. And on this image here, you can just start to see the wing pads developing here. And these are like little, little sort of bags that the the developing wings are, are contained in. And once this uh, nymph is ready to emerge, the, the wing pads will be really dark um, because that's then full of the, the adult wings. Um, most, if not all of them, crawl out of the shore to emerge, unlike mayflies, which will emerge at the, the water surface. Um, these all just crawl out and then crawl up a, a bankside vegetation or up a tree or, or a, a bridge abutment or, or so on. Just a couple of images here of a species um, crawling out of its uh, out of its nymphal skin. You can see here it, it, the back of the thorax has has split and the adult has crawled out there. And you can also see that the wings are quite soft and pliable at that stage, and, and so are the antennae. And then again, um, just as with the the um, larval instars the adult has to harden up so it's a bit it's a bit um, vulnerable at this stage it will need to go and sit and wait for its its wings to harden up to be able to fly or to otherwise um, move around what is it what's interesting with this is because they crawl out of the the water um to 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 emerge you you will find these cast skins these larval skins um after they've done that so in in a in the morning after a, an emergence at night, you can find, if you look at the, the stones on a, on a river bank, you can often find these little cast skins um, stuck to the, the stones. And they're actually really useful for ID because if you if you look at them, they've got all the features there. You know, um, they're, they're um, perfectly preserved in most cases. The, the only bit that's really damaged is on the thorax, and we don't tend to use that as a, for identification, but you can see the markings here. Um, you can see the the uh, um, the femur and the the tarsi, and they're all all perfectly preserved. Um, one of the the um, one of the things that people sometimes um, get a bit confused about is that when they they go to uh, ID an exuvia like this, they use the adult part of the key, and this is actually still this is the nymph that we're we're looking at here. It's just the the, the ghost of the nymph, if you like. Um, so it's quite possible to use the sort of information that I'm going to give you in the second part of this presentation, this workshop, um, to actually use that to ID um, Exuvia as well. And here's an adult, um, which, uh, you know, we can see here is similar to the larvae, it's got, uh, except it's got wings. Um, in stoneflies, the forewings and the hindwings are of a similar size, and the wings are held flat or rolled around the body when they're at rest. When they actually first come out of their uh, of the water and they emerge from the the, the larvae, the wings can be a bit upright, um, but they quite quickly harden up and, and flatten down. Interestingly, many species lose their tails on emergence. Um, so it's, it's an evolutionary um, trait that um, the uh, so, so some of the some of the species lose their tails, which is actually quite useful because then that can help us separate out which which family we've got. And here we go just to show just to emphasise the fact that they're just really nymphs with wings. Um, this is one of the eyes of perla species. And you can see that the body shape and, and, and layout is, is pretty similar between the, the, the larvae at the top and the adult at the bottom. 
Just one uh, other thing on on wings. Um, the stoneflies uh, display this this trait called brachytry, um, which is uh, a term used to to describe shortened wings. And this is a this is out of a, a, a textbook, and you can see this is the same species, but various different um, specimens have different lengths of wings, going from fully winged on the left to micropterous, as we would call it, very short winged on the right. And this can be for a number of reasons. Um, one of the main reasons is that uh, is sexual dimorphism. So the, the male and the female are, are different. Um, this is our endemic species again, the orange striped stonefly, which you're all going to be able to ID uh, after this because it's it's dead easy. Um, and we can see here on the bottom is the, the female fully winged. Um, and at the top is the male, which is short winged. The, the wings are about half the size of the of the, of the body. Um, not really sure the reason for this, the evolutionary reason for this. It, it, it could possibly be something to do with dispersal that the, the the female needs the wings to actually be able to get uh, into the air and, and move around to um, lay her eggs. Although they're pretty poor flyers. Um, they use them more as a, a gliding mechanism to get um, to, to jump off something very high, uh, whereas the male just needs to find a, a, a female to, to mate. Um, this can this this sexual dimorphism can be um, quite severe. Uh, this is the common black stonefly, which if you remember was the other one on that banknote. Um, and that's the female there, which is fully winged, whereas the male um, that's the male there. You would be mistaken for thinking that was actually the nymph, but you can just about see there's a tiny little slither of wing there, um, and that's that's all the wings that it has. Um, so that's a, that's a very extreme example of of uh, sexual dimorphism in, in wings. Um, the other reason that you might find uh, brachypterous stoneflies is uh, altitudinal. So this is a little piece of work that David Price did um, some time ago now in on stoneflies in Scotland, and he was looking at, at the um, the length of wings dependent on uh, on the altitude. And this particular species, Leuctra hypophis, which is out and about just now, um, the length of the wings as you went further and further up the hill, um, the wings got shorter and shorter. And that's thought to be because if because they're such poor flyers, if they were actually to fly off at a, a higher altitude um, where it's windier, they would just get blown away. Um, and so it's probably just that they've they've uh, they're evolving that that brachyp tree to prevent um, dispersal. So it does beg a question, though: How do they find each other? Um, if you've got a male that is is short winged and uh, a female that is is fully winged. Um, and mayflies have evolved a really neat trick for doing this. Um, uh, hopefully this will work because I've got some uh, sound to show you. But basically they, they use their bodies to drum out a beat on the on vegetation or on stones or on 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 sticks and things around the around the stream. And the the um, female will drum, the male will reply. Uh, sorry, the, the male will drum, um, the female will reply, uh, and they'll they'll triangulate and they'll find each other. And here's just some examples of this. So we can hear. I hope you can all hear that. But you can hear these these red ones, these rapid ones, are the male, and then the female replies, and then they've made contact there. Another example here from a different species. And these are unique to the species. So this bottom one that I'm just playing just now is Perla bipunctata, um, the, the, the largest stonefly we've got in, in the UK. And it, um, you know, you, you can tell which species it is from the from the um, the, the drumming that it makes, the, the beat that it makes. Um, I'm going to stop it because it's just going to keep going. Um, this one here is Taneoptrix nebulosa. So this is um, 
just a little video that shows you this from close to the ending. Um, and you see it vibrating its abdomen against the against the stick. Now this is audible to us, and what we don't know is whether the the, the stoneflies are are hearing this, or whether it's more likely that it's vibration that they're picking up. Um, it's it's really it's it's really neat. Um, it's a really neat thing that you can do at home as well. If you collect a stonefly, you can put them in a, a, a little a little cardboard box like this here, um, and and stick it on your on a microphone um, on your on your phone and record them doing this. And the 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 females stop drumming as far as we know. They stop drumming once they've been mated. So uh, um, you need to get fresh specimens if you're going to try that. Oops, and he's going again. No, oh, no, we're all going. Right. Um, moving on to collecting stoneflies. Um, I've got this image in here. It's, it's not stoneflies. This guy's collecting, but this is the, the kind of the thing that got me into mayflies and stoneflies. I could not believe that there were so many mayflies on this bridge that, they, that, that this chap was having to move them out of the way so he could drive across the bridge. And this is on the on the um, Mississippi. This is a hatch of Hexagenia mayflies. Um, my I suppose my my hero in stoneflies is Kenneth Morton. Um, he described 16 species of stoneflies, a lot from around close to where I'm I'm sitting just now. Um, he was a he was a banker. He was a bank teller. Um, he he was born in 1850s. Um, he lived in Carluke uh, in Lanarkshire in Scotland, um, and he became a, a world authority on on stoneflies. Um, he moved through to Edinburgh uh, to work in the bank there and continued his his study of stoneflies. And the museum in Edinburgh has his collection, which has includes these amazing slides that he made of different species, like this type specimen of Capnia affinis. Um, it, it is a, it is a wonderful resource, um, and you know it, when you actually start trying to walk in his footsteps, you realise just how tough it must have been to do that sort of thing. They were travelling by train, they were then having to walk long distances to go and go to sites. But they were making this fantastic um, um, information about, about our stoneflies and other species. He also uh, named a lot of species uh, or found a lot of species. Um, this is actually, this wasn't uh, one of his species, but one that he worked on, which is the, our, our endemic um, Northern February Red. And these are the collections here. And the information that is available in these collections is really important for us to find out more about the species. A lot of these are from Thankerton on the Clyde. It would really, we don't think it occurs in the Clyde anymore, but it'd be great to do some target work to try and find out if it, if it does st is still holding on there. He also got to some really, uh, really, remote places you know again bear in mind this is in the early 1900s um this is Loch Echican um up in the Cairngorms at 927 meters um and Morton collected here it's it's a tough place you know freezing over in the in the winter um and who knows what it looks like just now it's probably um, completely frozen over but he collected um, a species from here that he described as new to science, um, the northern black stonefly, Capnia atra. And this is, uh, you know, and he went on to collect in other upland um, lochs to, to find the species elsewhere. And so the main, uh, Morton was collecting um, adults. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is, is larvae. Um, the main technique for collecting larvae is kick sampling, and I know many of you may have already done kick sampling through riverfly monitoring or, or other things. But I thought I'd just give you a quick um, overview of, of uh, kick sampling. So hopefully this video will work. So basically you put a net into the water with the water flowing through it and that opens up the net and then you're able to disturb the bed upstream of the net uh, with your foot to let anything that's that's in the bed just flows down through the through the net so 
here we can see um, it's Charlie Bell from the Field Studies Council sampling the stream. Um, she's kicked there for up to three minutes and now she's looking at some stones just to rub off anything that's stuck to them um, to get anything off them. What's interesting with them um, stone flies um, because of the type of stream that they live in it's not it's not that uh, a lovely little stream like this it's it's usually quite boulder strewn and and quite a, a chunky stream um you need to adapt your technique slightly and one of the things that is really useful to do is to put your net downstream of a bigger stone and then just hook your foot underneath the stone and the little packet of uh, organic material that is gathered underneath the stone gets washed into the into the net and that's where all the stone flies are. What Charlie's done here is now she's just um, emptied the, the net into a bucket. She's removing any of the, the coarse debris, washing off any anything that's in there um, and then she'll put it into a tray and then that's when our, our ID starts. We um, can also look for adults uh, as uh, you know, I've shown you some adults already. And you can use many different techniques for, for that. You can uh, sweep through vegetation, you can uh, beat trees, you can you know use a, a net to actually catch them off of vegetation. And, and sometimes you need to get quite close to them to, to get them into the, the tube to avoid them escaping the net. And some are also attracted to light. Uh, so you can use a light trap to to take some of them as well. Some of the uh, it's actually interesting that, that some of the eyes, the perlodidae eyes of Perla and Pelodes um, are attracted to light. Um, but one of the really neat uh, things about stoneflies, particularly this time of year, is that you often find them on fence posts like this. Um, this is uh, Northern February Reds on a fence post near Boat of Garten. And every fence post along the, along the stretch had one or two stoneflies on it. And the reason for this is, is uh, quite interesting. If we look at fence posts, this is a little bit of work that was done in, in uh, Scandinavia. And if you look at um, fence posts through the spring, and these are these are, um, these are meant to be fence posts um, on the 2nd of February, the 24th of March and the 19th of April. In, in the very early part of the season, the, the sun is very low in the sky um, and very not very warm. Um, so in this study, the on the 2nd of February, the, the, the ambient temperature was three degrees. But if you look at the temperatures of the different parts of the the, the fence post, you know, yes, the top and the the, the side in, in shadow were round about the same, but the side with the sun on it was 22 degrees, which is, you know, it, was is is really useful for an insect um, to allow them to bask and to gain some heat and some energy to actually go about their uh, mating and dispersal. As you move through the year, 24th of March, a month later, a month or so later, you know the, the ambient temperature is 8.1 degrees, um, but you're you're getting um, you're getting the, uh, higher temperatures on the top of the fence post. Um, and then by the time you get into April, you're getting really quite high temperatures on, on both the, the, the side that's that's receiving the sun and the top of the, the, the fence post. So this this is why these stoneflies are actually finding these fence posts so attractive. Um, they will also be found on other structures. So you find them on bridge parapets um, uh, and on bankside trees. I've found um, orange stripe stoneflies 12 feet up a tree um, the, you find the exuvia up there and they're clearly trying to get up as high as possible so they don't have to do much flying. They can just do a bit of controlled dropping into the river or to, to the river. Um, we at Bug Life, we are using this uh, phenomenon of, of them going onto fence posts to try and find out a bit more about the distribution of, of uh, particularly the Northern February Red. We've got a survey running just now which basically asks you to go out, walk along the river, um, find some fence posts that have got some sun on them and take a picture of any stoneflies and send them in. Dead simple. Um, we'll, I think Craig will be able to send round a link to this survey um, at the end. And uh, we'd be really interested in any records of any stoneflies from anywhere. Um, but particularly if, you, if you're in the Cairngorms or along the Clyde, um, or on the Y and Usk to look for this particular species, the Northern February Red, 
um, because we'd like to get a better handle on, on what its distribution is. And um, more generally, for, for getting records into the recording scheme, we prefer to get them through iRecord. iRecord's a really uh, useful um, tool. It's, a, it's an online tool which allows you to load up all your records. You can add pictures to your records so that, that I can then look at them and say, yep, that's correct, or, and so on. And then this then goes into an online atlas, um, the NBN atlas which uh, uh, people share their records with. So uh, the other good thing about iRecord though is that it can help you with your ID because you can go on there, you can search other people's records and you can look and see what they've, um, you know, when, when I verified a record, you can then go back and look at the pictures that that person has submitted and compare it with yours. So for instance, this is a record from Shan Flint um, and she's put in this, uh, this image of Dinocras cephalotes. Now, if you've got a specimen that you think is Dinocras, you could then compare it to Sharon's pictures um, and and be more confident about your results. We're also quite active on social media. Um, there's a few of us that tweet about stoneflies. Um, Hugh Feely and, and Sharon Flint uh, featured in this one here. And, you know, we're just putting up bits and pieces about about stoneflies. Every so often I go through a spell of doing a stonefly Saturday where I do something about stoneflies on a Saturday and then I forget about mayflies on a Monday, which um, I probably should do as well. Um, I think the, the key is to try and get more people recording stoneflies, which is why it's so great that so many people are on this call today. Um, me just at the end now that's the contact details for the recording scheme um it's kind of hosted it's hosted through bug life um and through the biological record center um we are affiliated to the riverfly partnership and together with the mayfly and the, the caddisfly schemes um we form the riverfly recording schemes um those are the contact details there that's my twitter handle there and that's the link to um, iRecord. So I'll stop just now and ask just if anybody's got any questions before we move on to do to have a much more closer look at the ID of of the larvae. Great, great. thanks, Craig. Uh, there are a few questions that have come through while you've been speaking. Speaking, the first of which was, can the wing pattern be used to identify the type of stonefly? In some cases, yes. So the, the pattern of veins is used um, to identify which family they're in. Um, the the coloration is used. So particularly in the in Brachyptera species, they have bands on their wings, or in Tenyoctergids. In general, they have bands on their wings, and the number of bands is one of the features that we would use to ID them as well, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Sarah has asked, how loud is the drumming? It's audible, um, depending on what the surface is. Um, if the, if the, um, if it's, uh, you know, in one of these cardboard boxes, you hear them, you know, um, it, so, it, but, but it does, I, th I think it must be vibration that they're using to actually find each other because the, um, you know, if you think about a, a, a mountain stream, you know, it's quite a noisy environment um, and I, I can't believe that the hearing would be that, that good. A follow up question to that from mm -hmm. Jane was, uh, do, do they choose particular vegetation on which to drum? I guess, I guess She's meaning do particular species use particular vegetation on which to drum? I'm not really sure. Um, I, I'm, I'm guessing they must have a they must have a preference, but whether that's species specific, um, they, they need something that, that the the uh, vibration would travel in. Um, so, you know, what we use when we're trying to get them to drum is a bit of stick or a bit of wood, because that seems to work quite well. You know, you can pick up the the sound quite well. Um, but whether there's any preference, I don't know. Brian has pointed out that Loch Etchikin is fishless. Um, okay, that's interesting. So, so fishless lochs are are really interesting um, 
habitats because you know fish are main predators of some of these species and sometimes you do get species in fishless lochs that you wouldn't get elsewhere um it, a really cool thing you can look at in in a garden pond is whether you've got phantom midge larvae phantom midge tend not to occur in ponds that have got fish in them um there capnia atra does occur in places with fish though um st mary's lock in the borders has fish and that's a good site for capnia atra Okay. Rebecca has asked, how will this amount of snow be affecting the abundance and distribution of stoneflies? That's an interesting one. Um, so they probably emerge due to day length at this time of year rather than anything to do with temperature. Um, what we, and they do emerge out onto snow. Some of the best ways of finding them at uh, this time of year is just to go and look for black spots on, on snow. They, um, Quite a few of the winter species, like the capnia species and, and so on, have this uh, ability to super cool themselves, so they can survive down to minus eighteen, um, quite quite happily um, by by avoiding touching the ice effectively. And um, once once they touch the ice uh, with their body, then ice crystals can can um, be produced in their hemolymph. Um, so they, they just need to avoid touching the ice, and that's why I mentioned at the very start about having long legs and keeping the body up from the off the off the surface. Um, I've sampled I've sampled in uh, minus minus twelve minus thirteen um, in in rivers, and you know the the water in the river is 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 warmer than that, obviously. But you know you do get large you know you get grue coming down the river, you get big chunks of ice coming down the river. And they're happily living in there, you know. Um, they they're adapted for that. Um, you know, they are a they are a northern species. They, and we, you know, you find them up into into the Arctic as well. And um, there's there's uh, in the Canadian Arctic. Deborah's asked, how long do the adults live for? Um, the adults can live uh, for. You know anything from a month to three months um some are a lot shorter length of time um it really depends what species um they uh, the most of them mature their eggs for a, a period as well um there's only i think one species in the uk which actually is ready to go with eggs um almost immediately so they and that's capnia uh, trichnia bifrons which um uh when the eggs when the eggs are laid they hatch immediately so there's no incubation period either um but there's that that um maturation period um the the flight periods of individuals can range from a week to maybe a couple of you know up to a month maybe okay uh, Amanda's asked a question about the English name stoneflies. Are they, are they called stoneflies because people found their maltings on stones after they emerged? I'm not really sure what the origin of it is. Um, they're, they're found in stony rivers, um, but potentially it, it, I've never thought of it that it could be the exuvia. Yeah, it could be. They, they are, they're called um, stoneflies pretty much across the world, but I don't know if that is because they were called stoneflies in English first and then other people have used it. But in uh, Germany, they're Steenfliegen. Um, so yeah, it's the same same idea. Bumika has asked a more general question. Have you ever visited outside Scotland for the research of macroinvertebrates? Yeah, um, so I've been to uh, Japan, um, Sri Lanka, yeah, Tanzania. It's, it's interesting. What's interesting is that uh, you go to these places and you you know you're you, you don't have a common language, um, but but we do have a common language and that's actually Latin. Um, so you can go and have a look at a collection of of insects that have been collected from there, and see names that you recognise and and have an idea about what the habitat might be that those those species are from. Chris has asked. Uh... What, what he's called a basic question. Um, 
What what is the general definition of the genus stonefly? And his basic question is what what is the function of the tail in both the nymph and the adult? You mentioned that they often drop off. So does that mean they're not essential? So in the nymph, they they always have tails, um, and I, it's probably to do with predation. So the the if you look at a, a nymph of a, a stonefly, they have um, long antennae at the front and long tails at the back, and it's probably a basic basic thing of you know go for the back end, don't go for my head. Um, in the adults, they don't need that because they've got wings or, or, or they can run away uh, otherwise they can hide um so i probably it's just been a you know it's it's something that they don't need to spend any energy on doing anymore making having tails um how do you describe a stonefly um so the order of stoneflies are uh, plecoptera um, means hardened wings or folded wings sorry um and the folding of the wings across the back is is one of the things that you would you would look for um, the tails in the species that have them would be one thing you'd look for. Um, trying to think what else. Probably the probably the folded wings and then the wing venation would be the the key things you would look for. Jeff, uh, Jeff has just put a question in. Is there an easy way to distinguish between a stonefly and a caddisfly in flight? Um, Yes, caddis flies, uh, may, uh, stoneflies are pretty haphazard. Stoneflies tend to fly directly off the water. You know, direct, they they come, they want to get to the bank as soon as possible. If they're if they're they don't like being across the water. Um, some some stoneflies don't fly at all and will actually just swim off this off of things and, and swim across the water. Um, some of the big ones might do that as uh, as well. Caddis flies tend to be a bit more directional, a bit more better flyers. I mean, some caddis flies can travel long distances to uh, you know uh, to to light or to uh, um, to uh, females, um, whereas stoneflies, no, they just want to get onto land and then run about. They'd rather run than fly. Okay. Um... Sean or Shan? Um, Shan, I think. Uh, an abundance of stonefly larvae is generally a good indication of what? Um, so good water quality, um, good environmental quality. Uh, got to be careful, slightly careful because stoneflies are fairly tolerant of acid conditions. Um, they're also fairly tolerant of heavy metals. Um, so it, it's not so much about what what stonefly, what the abundance of stoneflies is, but what the community is as a whole, you know. So if you had lots of stoneflies but no mayflies, that might indicate acidity um, or or another something else. The other thing um, is that you do get some stoneflies that are more tolerant of organic pollution than others. Um, so uh, some of the Namura species and Lutra species, uh, you will find them in places that have got a bit of pollution. But generally speaking, if you've got one of the big stoneflies, um, you know, Pearl or Dinocrast, that, that are living in the stream for three, three and a half years, you know, you've, you can be fairly confident that the stream has been healthy for those three, three and a half years. OK, and uh, last question, I think, from Brian. What taxonomic characters separated the subspecies that was referred to? Oh, that's the identification session that we're going into. <laughs> um, Excellent. Lead, leads on nicely. Yeah, we'll, we'll go into that in the next session. OK, yeah, the, I think that's all the questions okay. just now, Craig. So if you want to crack on. Yep, I'll share my screen again.